Greetings in our Lord Jesus Christ. I deliver this lecture from the position of a Roman Catholic Christian and therefore think with the Catholic Church, Sentire Cum Ecclesia, with the hope that the same generosity that I accord to others would be granted me as well. This lecture proposes to explain compelling reasons for interfaith engagement being an imperative in this day and age. The concern for interfaith dialogue has resulted in the emergence of three general views of religions which will be briefly explained together with an identification of some of their respective key proponents. The discussion is then brought to a deeper level of intensity as Raimond Panika's particular pluralistic position as a unique model of interfaith dialogue is explained and briefly assessed from a viewpoint that is hopefully consistent with the faith of the Roman Catholic Church. Panika's model of dialogue serves as a case in point for my claim that interfaith engagement can be a dangerous enterprise. Acutely aware of the compulsory encounters between the Christian and the religious other, Karl Runner opined that non-Christian religions could no longer be perceived from a distance, for they had now come to make themselves present in the midst of modern humanity and had been integrated into the lives of people. Societies used to function in homogeneous fashion in terms of language, race, and religion, even if they were somewhat conscious that there were other religious communities in existence alongside them. In fact, interreligious encounters resulting from geographical proximity, military invasion, and other similar causes could be more or less ignored. Even in Asia, the coexistence of populations comprising different forms of traditional life was a given which seldom required for these religious traditions to mutually interact with one another. Evidently, interfaith relations was a very peripheral issue at most, or at least a non-issue. Since activities of imperialism brought about encounters with other cultures and religions, it had become impossible to ignore the presence of religious cultures and traditions different from one's own. Furthermore, one also cannot neglect to make mention of the shock waves that was sent to both the religious and the non-religious circles of the world population with the terrorist attacks of September 11th in 2001, which was largely to be understood as a confrontation between those perpetrators and the Western civilization in the name of Islam. Among the many outcomes of this fatal historical event, was the emergence of a very vocal intellectual movement whose key proponents were identified by Alistair McGrath as Anglo-Saxon Protestant males from remarkably similar backgrounds of privilege and power called the New Atheism. Its advocates were decidedly insistent that mankind's erroneous belief in God was the reason for such atrocities as the 911. In evangelizing its case against belief for God, this tenacious anti-religious movement arguably exhibits characteristics of being yet another religious confession that exalts its doctrines birthed from its tightly held humanistic ideologies. The Christian scholars of the West are now battling to defend the faith of their religious remnant through publications and live debates in opposition to the tenets and arguments of the new atheism. In fact, inter-traditional cooperation is now taking place because of the common sense of religions or traditions being under threat. This is perhaps particularly felt by those Abrahamic religions which once perceived themselves as being proponents of the sole truth, and this does not preclude Christianity. And then there is the whole arena of globalization that has intensified in the past couple of decades. As technology has enhanced economies, transportation, communications, and even politics, 
the shared space of humanity has become more accessible to a much bigger proportion of society compared to a century ago. This means that societies are encountering one another in an unprecedented manner, such that those which did not overlap in times past have now become members of one larger social entity, a single world that includes them as sub-societies. One would not be going too far in postulating that if there was one historic phenomenon characteristic of the 20th century, it would be globalization. That it has impacted the volume of emigrations worldwide, the religions and cultures of partners that people choose to bind themselves to in marriage, and daily habits of media consumption of the world population, among other effects of globalization, makes it an epochal reality. This is perhaps what led to Samuel Huntington's thesis that the main conflict experienced by humanity today is a cultural one, and that this conflict pertains to the great civilizations. The 9-1-1 event only serves to validate Huntington's argument. To further expound a host of other compelling reasons for the Church's need to be awakened to the presence of other religions might be unnecessarily going beyond the scope of this lecture. But all these cases in point are meant merely to give credence to Rana's explicit warning that the times now call for a greater consideration of how both deliberate as well as accidental encounters be addressed constructively. For these signs were and continue to be a clarion call for the Christian world to heed the new state of cultural and religious civilization. Despite the intensity of globalization as a result of modernity, it does not at all mean that religion has been on a trajectory towards perpetual demise. The ostensible corrosive effect of modernity upon religion has been a long debated subject. If it used to be taken for granted that as societies progress, they would increasingly become secular, it has now been empirically proven otherwise. Secularism has taken on a variety of meanings in both the philosophical and social scientific dimensions. It has generally been understood as a state of being centred on worldly affairs instead of being religion-centred. Visible expressions of secularism would be typified through a preoccupation with scientific knowledge and human self-regulation through which God is rendered redundant. The foremost train of thought of the secularization theory which arose in the 1950s and the 1960s was that the onset of modernity inevitably led to the decline and eventual demise of religion in society and among individuals. A prominent proponent of this disappearance thesis was Peter L. Berger, who then suggested that Western modernity was characterized by the onset of religious interpretations being discarded from the worldview of individuals. In relation to this thesis, he defined secularization as the process by which sectors of society and culture are removed from the domination of religious institutions and symbols. In accordance with this line of thought, religion is destined to dissolve on the onset of the scientific era. It is held to be simply institutionalized ignorance and superstition. A less intense interpretation of secularism is to be found in the differentiation thesis which holds that while the religious dimension is increasingly marginalized from the social arena, it sustains a level of significance in the individual's private life. This theory is advanced by Brian Wilson, who denies the cessation of religiosity and expounds the possibility of religion being rendered insignificant only insofar as the social arena is concerned. Berger, some three decades later, since his contribution to the secularization thesis in the 1970s, admits that the wrongness of the secularization thesis has been made apparent through the intensifying religiosity 
of the global society. Fred R. Von Menden observes that modernization has not obliterated the importance of the supernatural to adherence to Islam, Christianity and Buddhism. While Berger acknowledges the reality of modernization having propelled some secularizing effects, he asserts that the effects of counter-secularization outweigh the effects of secularization. For this reason of patterns revealed sociologically with regards to the strengthening of religion on a global scale, with the exception of the European continent, the role and importance of religion cannot be ignored. Furthermore, in the light of the manner in which the size of our common space has shrunk because of mutual accessibility, religious communities need to negotiate a common existence among themselves. Marco Pallis asserts that dialogue and cooperation among religions requires goodwill, a kindly feeling shared between religious adherents and leaders in order to succeed in a reform. Such required kindliness and goodwill, while easily identified as a legitimate expression of Christian character, is perhaps the very reason that interfaith dialogue and cooperation poses a cognitive dilemma to its participants. An implicit fear for many a Christian is that of remaining in the tension of standing between a firm conviction of the uniqueness of one's religious truth claims and entering into the religious worldview of another in an attitude of epistemological humility. At the same time, the shrunkenness of our common space renders this struggle a non-negotiable for we must somehow incorporate those whose beliefs are different from ours and indeed even contradictory to ours into the schema of our own religious worldview. This conflicting tension between fidelity and hospitality is not one that can be ignored. And yet the fathers of the church and the councils, and in a particular way the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, would not permit us to retreat into hostility. But such determination does not make the task simpler, for it entails the daunting challenge of ploughing our way through decades and centuries of prejudices, cultures and also language barriers. In defining the dilemma of emerging with what he calls an ethical theology of dialogue with other religions, Michael Barnes succinctly notes the nature of the intricacies inherent in this interaction between the Christian faith and other religions. I quote, The history of interreligious relations, often a record of colonial exploitation and unresolved ethnic and intercommunal rivalries, makes a confused situation even more complex. The dangers of manipulation by one party or the other the possibilities for misunderstanding on both sides are all too real. Emphasize the distinctiveness and you encourage a self-satisfied sectarianism. Suppress it and you risk a fundamentalist backlash." Unquote. This tension notwithstanding, dialogue should lead to the deepening of one's commitment to his own faith rather than an erosion of the same. Jacosilius insists that individuals and groups entering into interreligious dialogue need to first seek a deep understanding of their own religious traditions and then share their religious convictions and traditions with others. It is only when there is a deep understanding of one's own religious beliefs that progress can be made in achieving true understanding and respect for the religious beliefs of others. To that end, interfaith dialogue cannot be merely a polite meeting of participants from different traditions who engage in a pleasant swapping of superficial information. It certainly cannot be said that Christian thinkers have been lackadaisical on this matter. Much thought has in fact been given to the interaction of the Christian faith with other religions in the past several decades. The thoughtful responses in the Christian world, emerging as a result 
of increasing encounters with other religions has brought about three clusters of thought positions pertaining to the relation of the Christian faith to other religions. These clusters of thought are widely known to be exclusivism, inclusivism and pluralism. Of course, it could be easily argued that these classifications constitute oversimplifications and while I'm inclined to agree with such an assertion, this has to be set aside as a matter for a separate discussion. Broadly speaking, the exclusive position holds that other religions do not fit into the divine scheme of God's plan for the salvation of humanity. The inclusive position holds its own meta-narrative to be the culmination of all other religious trajectories, and the pluralist position relativizes the relevance and status of all religions in relation to one another. One could argue that exclusivist positions arise at least partially but significantly from a fear of erosion to the claimed uniqueness of one's religious truth caused by interfaith encounters. Jose Maria Vigil posits that Christian believers cannot contemplate the theology of religions from a safe distance as if it was an endeavour outside of and separate from ourselves. He further explains, I quote, It is something that touches us intimately, something that can send our faith and the very meaning of our life into crisis. It may lead us to reinterpret, re-understand and to express in different ways many formulas that we've been repeating since the earliest days of our childhood, things we always thought were a given just because." Unquote. These possibilities propose to us that it is precisely the fear of erosion to one's religious convictions stirred by interfaith encounters that has at least partially incited the exclusivist vision of the Christian faith in relation to other religions. It is at least in part a self-protectionist framework born out of compulsion. One of the most well-known proponents of the exclusivist position on religions is Karl Barth, who persistently defended the primacy of revelation and particularity. The hallmark of his position regarding Christianity in relation to other religions is said to be found in his 1934 Bahman Declaration, which was itself a reaction against the encroachment of Nazi ideology upon the Protestant community of his day. He asserts in this document that no other sources of revelation in the form of events and powers, figures and truths exist apart from Christ, and that this forms the basis of the Christian community's proclamation. Interpreters of Barth hold that he is herein alluding to the superiority of the Christian faith over other religions. There are of course others who would tend to relegate him to the category of universalism because of his discourse on the light and the little lights in his church dogmatics. However, the jury is still out on whether these latter enunciations represent Bard's attempt at some form of soteriological inclusivism. Whatever the case may be, one must not forget his dispute with his contemporary Emil Brunner who heavily criticised him for his neglect of the possibility of natural theology, after which Bart fiercely responded with his article 9, No. Inclusivism is an attempt to respect the place of other religions in God's salvation plan even if they do not possess the fullness of divine revelation. A definite proponent of this position is Karl Runner himself. In his estimation, since all human persons are the result of God's creative work, they constitute the very canvas upon which God makes his colours present. On his own, God cannot be perceived. Therefore, God has not left himself to remain out of the reach of human perceptibility. Human beings, however, have come to encounter God and his revelation in varying degrees depending on how much their immediate exposure to God's self-revelation comes to their awareness and conscience. Accordingly, 
Rana therefore advocates that there are those who continue to lack particular knowledge of the Christian gospel, but who nevertheless are already living the theological virtues revealed in Jesus Christ and are therefore anonymous Christians. I quote, The anonymous Christian in our sense of the term is the pagan after the beginning of the Christian mission who lives in the state of Christ's grace through faith, hope and love, yet who has no explicit knowledge of the fact that his life is orientated in grace-given salvation to Jesus Christ. Even outside the Christian body, there are individuals and they are to be found even in the rank of atheists who are justified by God's grace and possess the Holy Spirit." Unquote. Runner explains that such a person is an anonymous Christian both to others and to himself, for he would utterly deny that he was a Christian or even that he was a believer in God. Runner is not herein downplaying the uniqueness of particular divine revelation in Jesus Christ, and he is vehemently opposed to those who advocate the levelling down of the Christian faith so that it becomes just one among the many. In Rana's assessment, salvation continues to be offered and effected in Jesus Christ alone, except that those for whom it is effected may not necessarily be aware of this reality. The inclusivist position likely arises from the recognition that adherents of all religions are persons and are to be respected despite all religions possessing their own unique truth claims. This position generally holds that attempts to understand the faith of the other is not a slippery slope to agreement with and, further still, embrace of the truth claims of religions that might stand in contradiction to those of one's own. At the other extreme of the continuum, across from exclusivism, are found the various pluralistic positions. The pluralistic angle seems to betray a rather noble and self-effacing consciousness that the assimilation of the religious narratives of other religions into the Christian meta-narrative would compromise the uniqueness of other religions in accordance with their self-definition. As a reaction to this fear of the self, many thinkers, be they sociologists of religion, philosophers of religion, or religious practitioners, have spiralled into a web of pluralistic worldviews that they think would give rise to a democratisation of religions. In a way, one may say that this stems largely from a contrition arising from the Western imperialism of yesteryears, among other probable reasons. One such thinker to whom Rana stands in contradistinction is John Hick, a key representative of the pluralistic theology of religion. Hick declares that the time has come for a Copernican revolution such that Christianity, instead of being the centre of the religious universe, would, like the other religions, be centred rather on God. His theocentric pluralism argues that salvation can be attained by way of any religion which thereby renders moot the unique truth claims of Christianity regarding particular revelation in Jesus Christ and His Church. He dubs the claim to Christian uniqueness a myth along with the belief in the incarnation of God. In the remaining portion of this lecture, I wish to consider further the pluralistic position on religions as a way to demonstrate why the fear of compromise on the part of the exclusivists is not unfounded. In particular, I shall seek to present a reasonably sustained assessment on the religious position of Raimond Panika, whose stance of pluralism some may find to be particularly unique and intriguing. But such a line of thought is also precisely that which brings about a sense of horror on the part of Christian thinkers who are committed to the traditional tenets of the Christian truth claims. To be sure, pluralism for Panika is not to be constructed in the way it is commonly understood. He means it more as an attitude rather than a methodology. He is therefore not a proponent of subsuming all religious worldviews 
under a universal umbrella the way John Hick does, for that would mean sacrificing the uniqueness of each religious tradition. Neither does he propose the watering down of all religions to a lowest common denominator, for again, that would entail distilling each religion of its specific truth claims. He advocates pluralism as a means of experiencing the realities of the other, by way of openness such that one immerses himself into the otherness of the other and makes sense of the ensuing experience. Quote, Pluralism, in its ultimate sense, is not the tolerance of a diversity of systems under a larger umbrella. It is not a super-system. The problem of pluralism arises when we are confronted with mutually irreconcilable worldviews or ultimate systems of thought and life. Pluralism has to do with final, unbridgeable human attitudes. We speak then of two different, mutually complementary, although apparently opposite attitudes, beliefs, or whatever. Unquote. Raymond Panika takes issue with the fact that interfaith dialogue has always been an instrument for the preservation of peace and mutual understanding. Dialogue between persons, for him, is not to be instrumental for a purpose outside of our creationhood. It is an end in itself, and not a means to an end. Implicit in his contention is the assumption that philosophy of dialogue shapes its very praxis. His observation is correct that interfaith dialogue has until now taken place on a merely objective or the purely subjective level. In the former case, participants assume that they are able to suspend their subjective sentiments towards matters even towards their dialogue partners and lock their encounters in at the level of dogmatic discourse. In the latter instance, participants seek to encounter one another at the level of experience and relationships. But he pushes his case further by employing the argument that beings engage with one another, not externally, but by entering into the being of one another. He calls this reality a cosmotheandric one which is widely known to be a trademark of Panika's vision of reality in which there is a kind of perichoresis dwelling within one another of these three dimensions of reality, the divine, the human, and the cosmic. At the outset, one must admit that his employment of the traditional Trinitarian term applied by the Cappadocian Fathers to their description of the Holy Trinity is indeed nothing short of captivating. Further to that, in seemingly being somewhat influenced by Martin Buber's I and Thou frame of thought, Panika propagates the necessity of intimacy and communion in dialogue, without which it cannot be true dialogue. Without a willingness to enter fully into the other, as well as identifying the other as being a part of oneself, the one who is supposed to be a Thou, can only go so far as being a non-I, in fact, he does not just limit such communion to the relationship among human beings, but also between humanity and other members of creation. He acknowledges that this model of dialogue constitutes a religious act in itself. But if that is so, then it must register that such a religious act cannot be prescribed as one which is held agreeable by the standards of all religious tenets. From a Christian viewpoint, the perichoresis which he advocates is a confusion of categorical understanding regarding communion. Panika seems to have universalized the makeup of every being and genericized our compatibilities by virtue of our createdness. But createdness does not automatically imply sameness, and if the sameness of all creatures was a universal fact, then dialogue would have been rendered unnecessary. The fact of plurality of religions is itself an empirical refutation of Panika's dialogical method. From a traditional Christian perspective, 
Panika also totally ignores the role of the fallenness of the cosmos in humanity's possible distorted images and perceptions of God apart from divine self-revelation to His Holy Church. This is not to say that there is nothing true or good or even holy in other religions, but that notwithstanding, the fallenness of humanity apart from divine revelation must necessarily mean that a dependence on our own recognition of revelation, even if it is undertaken in collective fashion, is distorted at best. This is why the accompanying guidance of the Holy Spirit must also be incorporated into the Christian understanding of our ecclesial recognition of divine revelation. Because of his insistence on perichoresis and communion, Panika, in effect, abolishes in totality the reality of exclusive truth claims and asserts that if dialogue is to take place effectively, one must be converted fully into the being of the other, all this without so much as dismissing that which one previously was prior to this encounter. In effect, this must mean that there is no contradiction between being Christian and being Hindu, and that it is even possible to be bi-religious or even tri-religious as he has claimed himself to be. Again, this is certainly not to say that there is nothing that can be learned from religious traditions outside one's own, but learning and total vulnerability to assimilation so as to emerge with a hybrid religious creature that may in the first place look almost nothing like the one into which one claims to be assimilated are two distinct attitudes altogether. From a Catholic perspective, Panika's preachment is nothing more than religious humanism packaged as philosophical pantheism, and this sorry accusation is well summed up in his own tenet. I quote, We are constitutively open not only because the whole universe can penetrate us, but also because we can permeate all of reality. Unquote. He speaks of men not as a part of the order of creation, but as a microcosm of the created world itself. He cannot tolerate a world characterized by difference, for in the final analysis, everyone and everything must be subsumed into one another. In the process of this endeavor, his brand of pluralism implicitly persuades us to turn our attention away from the creator towards the self within and the self without. After all, in his estimation, there is no matter without spirit and no spirit without matter, no world without man, no God without the universe, etc. God, man and world are three artificially substantivized forms of the three primordial adjectives which describe reality. There is, in the final analysis, only reality and God is its creation. Rather, reality is God. One can easily understand from Panika's assertions regarding interfaith dialogue how Christian thinkers who are committed to the traditional tenets of the Christian faith might pander to a fear of such extreme compromise and insist on keeping within the margins of safety and self-protectionism that border on non-interaction with other religions. In actuality, both positions are probably motivated by fear of different sorts, which does disservice to authentic dialogue among religions. And with this, I end this lecture. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you.